This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. My name is Ray David. I'm a Holocaust survivor. On April 15, 1945, was my 17th birthday, and I was liberated from the Bergen Belsen concentration camp. I was born in Vilna, at, at that time it was Poland. I came from a secular family. I was the first grandchild and I was a pampered child. I was pampered by my uh, grandparents from both sides of the family. I went to private Yiddish school and I was a very happy child. 19, September 1st, 1939, the Second World War started. And of course, Poland lost the war Part of Poland was, di was divided between the Soviet Union, who took the eastern part of Poland, and the Germans took the western part. So we had the Russian army come to our town. The situation didn't change much because we were a working class family. My father was a tailor, and my mother was a clerk in a shop which was a printing shop and a, and a stationery uh, shop. And she started to work for those people when she was a teenager. We had it quite good. In the summer, we'd rent a, a cottage from the farmer about 10 kilometers from town. And the farmer would move into the barn and we rent, had the house for the summer. It was a wonderful life. In 1941, Hitler decided that he doesn't have, like the, the Soviet Union, which I don't know how many people did, but they attacked, they attacked the Soviet Union. And on the 22nd of, Ju of June, the war started again. Many people escaped from Germany to Poland, and they all, went, as many as possible, went east. And many of them came to our town. And when they said the atrocities which the Germans did to them, we thought that it, it cannot be so. We thought that they want our sympathy. Because how can a, a cultured people like the Germans do such crazy things? But soon enough we learned. As soon as the Germans came into town, they started that if somebody looked Jewish, they grabbed them, and the, the civilian population were will, willing corroborators with them, in particular when it came toward the Jews, because the anti-Semitism was rampant. After a while, they wanted to occupy the Baltic states. So they annexed Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Our town was historically belonged to Lithuania. It was established by the Lithuanians. But during the First World War, the League of Nations allocated Vilna to Poland. And the Lithuanians never forgave the League of Nations nor the Poles. There was no, no uh, communication between Lithuania and Poland. If you want to send a letter to, from my town to Lithuania, you had to go, uh, let's say, to Germany or to other place to send a letter, because otherwise they will not accept any mail from Poland. The, Lit the Lithuanians, then the Russian army came to the borders, guarding the borders, and they gave Lithuania our town, so the Lithuanians were overjoyed. They hated the Russians because they, they were not communists. Apparently, they made a pact, a silent pact with the Germans. These were rumors, but I'm not sure. But when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, they marched on, on, Lit on Lithuania. 
and the Lithuanians oh, uh, greeted them with open arms. Shortly after, they started to, to, to round up Jews. We had to work Star of David on, on the front and the back. Then we had to uh, wear, uh, wear armbands with a J like Jude. It was a constant torture. When I say a torture, it was a mental torture, not a physical at that time. They would go around if you were if you were an armband or a star of David on the front of your chest and in the back, they know who you were. So they would grab you off the street. You were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. You had to walk in the in, in on the on the road. You had a limited uh, a, um, fa facilities. You could not go to any store you wanted to go. September of forty one, they established the ghetto. My father was arrested on July 25th, 1941, and he was shot on the 20, on the 20, he was arrested on the 22nd of July, and he was shot on the 25th, and I have a document to prove it. They just came to arrest him because of a Jew, they thought he was a communist, which I, he was not, and they took him to the prison, and two days later they shot him. They took him to Panar, which was the killing ground. It was there about 10 kilometers out of town, and he was shot. In September, they started to create a ghetto. There were 60,000 Jews in Vilna before the war. You could not accommodate 60,000 people in that small area, so they created two ghettos. This was, in ancient times, this was the, the center of the Jewish community, but the Jews were spread all over town. They, since we were not travelers, we had no, no place to travel because the family was in town, we didn't have any suitcases. But we did have large pillows, and my mother just recuperated from a serious illness and she couldn't do much to carry anyway, but we took a large pillowcase, loaded with what we thought we could, should, would need because we never thought that, that the war would last that long. After all, when the Russians came, they came with tanks about three stories high, so how could they lose, lose a war with such tanks? Because the Polish army, we never saw any Polish tanks. My mother and I put things, whatever we could, in the pillowcases, and we were walking toward the ghetto. Whatever my mother could, she gave it to, we lived on the third floor in an apartment, and there was a Polish lady who would go three times a day to church, and she was always very nice and friendly, so whatever my mother could to bring down to her for safekeeping, she gave it to her. My mother and I were walking toward the ghetto, and this was the street we were walking on. On the left-hand side was a small street, and this was part of, we thought it was part of the ghetto. So we thought we'll go here. There were police standing, and they said, no, this is field, you go here. It was a good thing we did. We were sent, I think the Almighty was guiding us. But instead of going on the left, we walked straight ahead, and we walked there, we, there we were let in, and maybe three houses down the road, my mother's younger sister was standing in the courtyard, in the, at the entrance to the courtyard, and they said, we have a place to, to live. So we walked in there, the, we got a, a little apartment, which was, I cannot tell you the size, but very, very small. There was a table and a couple of chairs, no couch, no nothing. There was a bedroom without electricity, a windowless bed a bedroom, and I barely remember the kitchen. But it was a roof over the head, and we thought, well, we'll stay in the ghetto forever until the war, war, war will be over. The next morning when we woke up, we found out that the people who were in the first ghetto where we wanted to go in, at night they were taken out 
taken to the prison until they, they accumulated all the people they wanted and then they marched them to the killing fields. A girl who lived in our apartment complex, she escaped from these killing fields and when she came to the ghetto and I ran into her and she, sa and she looked wild. She was a, year, a couple years older than I am. And I said, uh, her name was Julia, but I called her Yulka. What happened? And she said, I escaped from Panari. And she mentioned the neighbors from our courtyard. She said, so and so was, was fell right in front of me and my parents were, were everybody was dead. And we thought, look, Julia is crazy. How could it be? We, you know, your mind is geared that you cannot, when it comes to such a horrible thing, you, don't, you cannot comprehend it. So you try to block it out from your mind. But soon enough we learned that the roundups were constantly coming along and here they gave a different, different uh, work permits. One was pink and one was yellow and one was green and one was any color of the rainbow. If you had a document like this, which means that you had a workplace, and during the roundup, they took you out from the ghetto to the workplace, and in the interim, while you were gone, they cleaned out the ghetto, and all the people were, were shot. We were lucky. In the courtyard where we lived, there was a basement, but the entrance to the basement was outside. You had to go from the outside. So the people who lived in that, in that courtyard, what we decided that we should make a hiding place. And we'd cover with all kinds of garbage and debris over the entrance. And then the, the apartment which was above the basement, we'd opened up the floor and put a ladder down and we could hide there. In one of those major roundups, they, uh, I don't even remember, there was a lot of people in the basement. There was electricity, but we didn't want to use the electricity because if the Germans would come in and the, the meter was running, we were afraid that they will notice there is somebody hiding. So we used candles. After three days, the candles didn't burn anymore. And all of a sudden, we heard thumping, and they discovered, I don't know, I don't think somebody, somebody pointed it out. But they started thumping, and they, they uh, moved away the debris from the, the original entrance to the, to the basement, and they discovered us. It was so hot there, that you couldn't wear your regular clothes. So I grabbed a coat and I don't even remember, maybe it was my mother's coat or somebody else's. And I put it down because that's all I was wearing is a slip. And we were marched to the main entrance to the ghetto. They were taking the people out to the, to the, to the uh, prison and then they would take them to Panari. Out came there was an entrance to another courtyard at the main gate to the ghetto. And a friend of my parents happened to stay there. And my mother and I were walking down and he said to the assessment, this is my sister and her daughter. Well, I was a tall girl at the age of 13. And he didn't believe that I was a, a child. So he said, well, she is not a child. And, and I opened my coat and he saw I was a, a kid. I wasn't an adult. So he shoved us into the courtyard. My mother's younger sister, when she saw us and the assessment was turned away, she snuck into the courtyard too. My grandmother, my mother's younger sister, went ahead of us and they, they were they were killed. We went back to the apartment. 
Then after the ghetto was em almost emptied out, we found another place to live. It was like a little store. When you go in any small town, you have a little grocery store, even here. And when you come in, there is a big, a big uh, like, like uh, in front of the window, where they put their goods up. So I suppose this was a little store like that too. There was only one room in the back. My mother made a curtain, so this was our bedroom. And my, own, my, my father had a younger brother who was a tailor. And he had a pink uh, work permit. So he said he'll take me as his daughter because we had the same last name. They had only one son. So I, I was on his, I had a, a permit to go with them. When it came the time for us to go with him, for me to go with them, I said, I'm not going. And my mother was very upset. Why? And, and I said to her, if, if I, I don't want to be alo left alone. I said, if, if, if you're going to be killed, so I'll be killed too, but I don't want to be left alone. I'm not going. We were lucky. We were very lucky. Time went on, and each time we found another hiding place, and my aunt was very was neurotic, and she was constantly running around and finding out what's going on. And she would always run into the place and uh, said, well, a roundup is going to be uh, 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 today or tomorrow, whenever. And one day, I think it was in 1943, she came running in and she said, there's going to be, they were talking about liquidating the ghetto. And she said, there is a big, there is a big hiding place right, ac right across the street. And she said, let's go there. And I was sitting at that, on that shelf. And I said, I'm not going. And she, she became almost hysterical. Why? And I didn't even have a chance to respond that there was a big explosion. They discovered the hiding place, and instead of uh, searching, they, they dynamited it. And to this day, when I talk about it, I can see the bodies being carried out. When I watched the, the, the earthquake in Haiti, and when they pulled out the bodies, I couldn't watch it because I, it came back to me like, like it was immediate. At that time, my aunt, my aunt didn't say anything to me anymore. The end of September, the ghetto was liquidated. And they told us to go. There was a convent, a Polish convent, not too far. And they had a president, Poland had a president, Marshal Pilsudski. He was a very beloved patriot. When he died in the 30s, in his will, he said that his heart should be buried at the grave of his mother's feet. His body is buried in the Wawel in, in, in Krakow. And there was a big black mausoleum and there was an honor guard uh, during the Polish uh, uh, regime. There was always an honor guard standing at that grave because it was such an important person. <coughs> the next, in, in, at night they were shooting rockets and each time I heard a shot, I, I was like in a convulsion, I was petrified. In the morning, they were, my aunt had a little girl, the age of four, and we were marching toward wherever they told us to go. And my aunt, they took away the little girl from my aunt. And they sent her in one direction and the little girl in another direction. My aunt never recuperated. And when I talk about it, I cry. It, it, it was so, 
I cannot, she, she, she was psychotic. And, and at that time, after the, even after the war, there was nothing, people didn't pay attention. You, you went to the concentration camp and you forget it and go on with your life. But things like this, you cannot forget. And she wasn't treated properly. So she, she died a, a neurotic person. Then they put us on a train, cattle cars, no food, nothing. They let us take whatever we carried with us, which was very, very little. And I don't even remember how many nights and days we were on the train, but they took us to Riga, Latvia. And there was a concentration camp, Kaiserwald. When we came there, we heard in our ghetto, in Vilna, we heard that there is a concentration camp, we didn't even know where, where they gas the people, and then the, the, the gas comes out from the light fixture, and then the floor opens, and the bodies fall into a pit. When we came to Kaiserwald, they took us in, the, in barracks, maybe twice the length of that room. Maybe not, of course, not that wide, but or maybe up to the second row. And there were straw mattresses. And we were looking, we moved the, the straw bags. We were looking on the floor if there was a straight line because we were afraid to touch the bulbs. In the daytime, there was no light. But even at night, we, we came in the daytime, so we didn't even know if there was light coming or not. But we looked if there is a, li a straight line in the floor, because if there is, then, then, then it's true. They'll, that's what they're going to do to us. Well, we couldn't find a straight line. They took everything that we had with us, they took away. I think they, they let us uh, wear our own shoes, and they gave us, uh, I think, striped uniforms. If you saw the, the in pictures or in the movies, striped uniforms, a woman got a dress and a long jacket for summer and winter, and men got the same thing but trousers and the jacket. After several days, it took us to another place near Riga, and this was a good camp. Actually, it wasn't a good camp, but we, we had heat. It was a big building. And I don't even remember exactly how many people. Men were separate from the women, but it was warm. It had heat, was heated. And when you came from the cold, there was hot water. And this was heaven. And we worked outdoors, laboring. We dug a hole here and put the dirt here, and then later we took the same dirt here and closed this hole, and then we dig another hole. But there were some of the Latvians, if they were in a good mood and had a little kindness in their heart, when they, took the, they had their lunches, they would just sneak it to, to somebody, and we shared it. But the luxury was that when you came back to, to our place, it was warm, and you could take a hot bath. The, the mega food we got didn't matter, but the comfort of a, warm of a warm place. We were there until early fall of, wait a minute, the beginning of 44. When the Russian front came closer, they tried to start to move us. So we marched to a place in, uh, in Latvia, which called Dundag, and I don't even know where it is on the map. I never tried to find it. There was a railroad track, and uh, cattle cars came, and they took us to Stutthof. Stutthof was hell on earth. It was a concentration camp near, near Danzig. Actually, Danzig was a free state because the Germans claimed it, and they called it Gdansk, 
and the Germans called it Danzig. And this concentration camp, there was one assessment, and his name was Zorger. And he always walked around with a whip. In addition to his revolver or whatever weapons he carried with him, I'm afraid even looking at those things, but he always carried a whip, and if he didn't like you, he hit you for whatever reason. There was no reason at all. At that time, my mother and my aunt and I, we decided that we are not going to be related. Because since they, they separated families, what we, my mother had her, married, her maiden name, I had my name, my last name, and my aunt had her uh, married name. And we didn't stay together. If I was in this row, my aunt was here, my mother was there. He came over to my aunt and he asked her, how old are you? And I think she told him she was 27. And he said, you're 30, you're old, you know what? <laughs> and he hit her. He asked me and I said I was 17. And he didn't say boo. After several days, we, we were shipped to another place. We were anxious to leave that hell. And they put us again in cattle cars and they took us to Germany. And it was a, a, it was a subsidiary from Dachau. It was Lager 4. It was like a hot underground, attached roof covered with grass and there was bunks on either side. There were 50 women. And you could walk in here. There was no place to sit, and in the end of the, oh, there was a little window at the end of the hut. And then there was a, a, a stove. If we could gather some wood someplace, we could, we could uh, uh, hit the place. But underground, it wasn't too bad. And then actually we didn't, we didn't spend winter there. But one thing about that place was there were a lot of men, but there was only 50 women. And there was an assessment who was, he didn't do it for the kindness of his heart, but if, if he took the women to farmers to work in the fields, they paid him with food. But he always saw to it that we were fed. So whatever ration we got, when we got back to our, to our camp, we could give it across the, across the fence to the men. And it so happened that my mother recognized a friend of my father's. So the duration we were there, we always gave him three portions of bread, which for that time it, it saved his life. We stayed there, I taught, until November, I thought until no, no December. I thought until December, but last uh, uh, in uh, October two thousand eight, I was invited to go. They opened a museum in Bergen-Belsen, and I was invited to come because when they when they opened the museum, I was not invited, and my daughter was very upset, and she sent them emails, and they said they had, they're going to have a reunion, so they'll send me an invitation. So my daughter and I went last October, not uh, in 2008. And I didn't remember exactly the date because who had calendars? I knew Sunday you know, but they didn't work and we didn't go to work because they didn't have to go to work. But otherwise, I didn't know what day of the week it was. We came in November the 17th of November in 1944 to Bergen-Belsen. And I found out because they had records. Bergen-Belsen destroyed their records. But they're trying to trace the people who were liberated in, in Belsen. They have the records who were liberated. And they're trying to, to trace where they came from. So the records show that we came from Stutthof to Koifering, 
to the camp, Lager 4, and from there we were shipped to Belzen, and we came there in, in December 17th. This was a death camp. I didn't realize until I was there in 2008 the size of it, because there were Poles, there were people which I knew about them. They, had, uh, they were mostly Jews, and they had foreign documents. And then there were gypsies by the thousands, and Russian uh, prisoners of war, and uh, Russian civilians. I knew about some, but I didn't know the, how many. It was, it, the, the, the size of the camp was mind-boggling. It was immense. We came 50 women. We found a sizable Jewish population there. They came from Auschwitz. And unfortunately, we spoke with a different accent, and they didn't like our accent. And since they had their own uh, Lanz people, they came from the same area, and they were in Auschwitz together, when they were dispensing the food, what they did, the minute they heard our voices, they made a derogatory remark and then gave, a, gave us the, the portions from the surface, which not that it was anything a lot, but there was maybe you had one piece of, of vegetable. When you go to the bottom, you maybe find three pieces of vegetables, but this they kept for their own. And we tried since we were 50, 50, 50 girls or women, and we tried to be active. Because if you're active, you make, you, they, they called it organizing. You, you try to steal some food someplace from wherever. And that's survival. You don't steal for the fun of it. That's, that's survival. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this was in April, beginning of April of 1945. We didn't know what was going on. What happened was that we started to look for work. So we were marching to look for work, and we had to pick up garbage or whatever. And when we passed by the German kitchen from, from the SS, when they threw out in the garbage can some of their food, which was edible, they covered it with ash. So at least if somebody would go into the bin, the garbage bin, they couldn't eat it because it's covered with ash. But when you're starving, nothing will stop you. Anyway, I found three potatoes. And nobody saw me taking the three potatoes, and I had a long coat, and I had a brown long scarf. It come around my neck, almost to my knees. And I put the three potatoes in the scarf, and I put it on my neck. And we were going back to the barrack. And if you saw pictures from the concentration camps, when they liberated Bergen-Belsen, when the, when the SS and, and the SS women were trying to clean up the camp because there were 20,000 dead bodies laying around, and then 14,000 died after the liberation. So they had to clean out the camp. And there was a tall blonde woman with a short haircut with a pug nose. And I don't know, I was standing in line to go back to the barrack. And she get a, got a hold of my neck right there. And she beat the living daylight out of me. She threw me on the ground and jumped on me. If I am not dead, if you don't believe in God, you have to start believing. Because if I wasn't dead at that time, I could barely get up. And the other women who were with me, they held me up so we could walk to our barrack. There were Russian women in our barrack, and they were stronger, much healthier than we were. And if they told you, if you had a bunk, get out, you got out, because otherwise they'll kill you. 
and we knew that the Germans, would, the Nazis will kill us, but I didn't want to be killed by a Russian. So she said, get out, so I slept on the, on the floor. And I said to my mother, you know, I'm going to the infirmary. I'm going to die anyway, at least I'll have a bunk to lay in. So I walked in the infirmary, and I went on a, they put me on a bunk, and they gave me a pill. I don't know what the pill was. Maybe it was poison, but I wasn't poisoned. I couldn't tell you. But the next morning when I woke up, the person that was near next to me was dead. I don't remember how many days I was there, but they dismissed me from the infirmary, and I had to walk, I don't know how far, but between the, the, the barracks, I could hold on to the wall and walk, but when it came between the barracks, I couldn't walk, I was too weak, so I would c crawl on the ground. On April 15th, we saw there was something going on. We heard shooting, and we heard, and there was quiet on the camp, and all of a sudden, there were less from the SS around. But they always said, if, and there was a big if, if we lose the war at midnight, we'll kill you five minutes too. But I don't know about other people, but I never gave up hope. I talked to the Almighty all the time. I asked the Almighty only to survive. I didn't ask for anything else, just to survive. And I was sitting, there was a bench right in front of the entrance to the barrack, and I was hanging down to my knees because they were shaking. And it was total silence. No shooting, and the SS was not there, not to be found. And then a truck came around, and there was a military, but I, I could see that they were not, they were not uh, Germans. And this was my liberation. We always thought that if we'll survive the war, we'll jump, we'll scream. I was numb. I was sitting there like a piece of, of clay, not knowing what to do. So we were liberated by the British Army. They didn't, they didn't realize what hit them because they have never experienced anything like it. And I think we were liberated before the other camps were liberated. So they started to give, feed the people their rations and many died. That's why there were 14,000 pe uh, people dead after liberation because they, they couldn't take the food which they were given. So this is the story of my life. Then we stayed on into the camp after liberation. They burned the old camp. And they put us, th nearby was a hospital and the military uh, facilities. There was regular, I, I don't know whether it was the Wehrmacht or the, Luft, the Luftwaffe, but I, we were lucky that we, we got, instead of being in one room, many people, there was um, officer's quarters, which was a small room with two beds. So my mother and my aunt and I got this little room, and we stayed there until 1949. My aunt remarried. And I, uh, after the war, we had pe many people from all over the world come to, to try to re rehabilitate us. And there was a lady who came from the UNRWA. She was from Belgium. She and her husband were in the underground. Her husband was killed, and she was very kind. And she told us, you cannot just be in the camp and do nothing. And she went, and since there was a hospital that she organized for us to be, have a school of nursing. And she saw to it that the, the German doctors in the hospital would teach. And from 1947 until 1949, I studied nursing at the hospital, and I worked there. So when I came to this country, they couldn't accept me, so initially I worked as a nurse's aide, 
And then I took a test, since I knew very little English. I took an exam, and at the exam, I was naive because I knew I was smarter. But you know, when you come to a strange country, you don't know the language too well. You don't want to take chances, and you don't want to, 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 uh, to sound sassy. And when we came here from the, from the community, there was uh, social services, and the social worker said to me, well, he asked me what I did, and I told him, and he said, well, when you go find a job or you go for a job, don't tell them what you know because they won't like you. And at that time, I was so naive that I didn't realize who cares. Today, I'm smart enough to say who cares. But at that time, you know, you come to a strange country. You don't know the attitude of the people, whatever. But anyway, in 1950, I took a test, and I passed for 10th grade. And I passed my test to be a practical nurse, a licensed practical nurse. And I worked as a, as a nurse in a nursing home. And then I met my husband, and then we got married. And my husband worked in a factory. And then we decided that a factory work, there is more to life than working in a factory. And, I, and we said, let's see what we can do. And Marquette University at that time offered that you, do, that you don't need a, a high school diploma. We'll accept you on probation. And for two years, if you do well, you'll get a degree after whatever of the requirements. So the two of us went together for moral support. He registered what was in February of 19, uh, 1952. And it took him 14 years to go to night school. And he got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And in the interim, we had two kids. He worked in a factory, and then he found an office job. But he did it. So that's the story of my life. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> 